Hello and welcome to Stopping the World. This is Ramesh. I hope you're doing well. Today we are talking to Dr. Eamon Anspro. Dr. Anspro is a leading astronomer and meteorologist from Ireland. He is uh, also the director of the Kingsland Observatory in Ireland and a few observatories in Spain. He is also the founder and CEO of Space Exploration Limited. He has also been part of the UK SETI Research Network and much, much more. Now, Dr. Ansbro also studies the UFO phenomenon in his spare time. He has tracked and recorded unidentified objects around Earth over the past few decades and believes that Earth is under surveillance by non-human intelligence. I would say that he is unique in the sense that he is one of the few mainstream scientists that is doing a systematic scientific analysis of data on anomalous phenomena and uh, after going through a lot of data he is convinced that there is a pattern to their appearance and he is currently working on a model that can predict UFO trajectories and possibly the times and locations when they present themselves. So I'm really excited to share this interview and I hope you enjoy this as well. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Dr. Eamon Anspro, thank you so much uh, for joining us, sir, all the way from Ireland. Uh, how are you doing today? Doing great, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you are able to join us today. And in my eyes, you are as mainstream as they come. So you are a, uh, you're, you are a researcher, an astronomer, an academic, uh, the director of the uh, Kingsland Observatory. And you also made a claim uh, that you believe that Earth is being visited by unidentified aerial objects and phenomena and you believe that we may be under surveillance and you presented a paper back in uh, 2001 at a SETI conference which I understand was not well received uh, so mm. maybe that is something we can, we can use as a starting point to kick off this conversation so I want to just jump to that point in time if you could tell us what exactly did you track or observe or record and how did it all begin? Well, I started um, in this particular field, which is a taboo field, if you can imagine, in 1990. Yeah. And it was caused by another astronomer who um, knew that I had a professional background in not only in astronomy, but also meteorology as well. Um, so I took on the project really as a, uh, well, not so much part time, but more of a hobby uh, because uh, this wouldn't fit in with other research I was dealing with at the time. So, um, so from 1990, um, I managed to um, receive uh, from this other astronomer who was in the position to uh, receive um, calls from the public. And it was from there that he provided all the um, people actually that I, I could actually meet up with. So there was about 20 people initially in 1990. Uh, I, I was totally confused about what people were seeing. Um, it just didn't make sense. So um, I uh, thought, well, maybe we're in the realm of what's called UFOs, uh, which I knew right. nothing about at the time. Um, so I um, uh, I paid for um, three uh, databases, computerized databases, um, from three organizations, um, particularly in the US and the UK, and actually uh, in France as well, uh, the uh, GPAN, CNN, CNES. And from there, I could see that there was uh, common characteristics of what people were seeing here locally. Uh, so I was realizing, well, it could be a worldwide phenomenon. This. Now, this is back in 1990. Now, I know it's a long time ago. Um, but, uh, you know, 
I felt, well, I'm still in a weak position here because uh, I'd need uh, a lot more data. You know, typical scientist, of course, you need the data <laughs> observations. Yeah. And that's where I'm coming from. Um, so um, this was a very different type of data that I, I would be exploring because normally I'd be using instrumentation to record data. But in this case, I'm dealing with uh, people, witnesses to these events. So the only way to to make it more substantial as a research project, I really had to meet an enormous amount of people. So I decided to um, make presentations in many locations uh, around the country. And it was from there I explored 150 uh, cases that I thought were worthwhile to explore. But in addition to that, I had about 500 people had come to me or contacted me um, about their sightings, but I could only take on so much being a one, a one person for doing this. Um, were they all from just Ireland or all over the world? Um, they were uh, Ireland and France and the UK. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so from there, um, uh, I could see that... Um, Again, the same characteristics were fitting in to all the databases that I had. Uh, so I was realizing, yeah, this is uh, definitely a phenomenon worldwide. It's not just a localized situation. So I, was, I, I wrote uh, some articles uh, by, published in 1992 in an astronomy journal, uh, more as articles, not as uh, scientific papers as such. Um, because I felt, well, this is could be an issue, you know, with uh, you know editors and that. Yeah. So so anyway, I uh, I had some ideas as to the patterns behind this, but they were purely ideas. I had no evidence for this. Um, I thought there might be an astronomical side to this, being biased, of course, being an astronomer. <laughs> um, and I thought I had something that would correlate a little bit. Um, dealing with uh, the moon, Mars, Jupiter. Um, I was thinking that maybe the UFOs are, could be extraterrestrial. Um, really complex area, just didn't have enough data. I also looked at 3D modeling uh, back in 91, 92, as to the inward flights of a hypothetical extraterrestrial craft uh, within 60 light years. and. Uh, this would be pre-Gaia times, like the relying on Hipparchus, which um, reasonably accurate. But uh, so from there, um, uh, I uh, got uh, more recordings from people during '92, '93. Um, met an enormous amount of people altogether in my spare time, and from there. Uh, I thought, well, there may be uh, a pattern to it somewhere. Um, I was in touch with others uh, who were working in the field um, and um, had private communications with, uh, with uh, one or two of these other scientists, engineers, <coughs> who had a, a deep interest in the whole UFO area, and they were also looking into patterns as well. Um, so we, we um, <clears throat> said by 93, 94, um, I uh, worked with another person who was an aerospace engineer who had a deep interest in this area. And uh, we were able to use his uh, computers in British aerospace in the spare time, which we shouldn't have been using. But, you know, if you're <laughs> in those days, we privately were, weren't that... Uh, how should put it, uh, processing speeds and bandwidth and everything was just extremely weak, you know. So you had to use something like an IBM uh, computers, which we did. And uh, we were getting results from it all right. We didn't know what it meant. Um, but uh, you, you're you also speculating as well, Ranesh, because you're in a completely unknown area. There's no textbooks in this area. No one has done any of this work before. So you're literally explorers, um, testing out things, experimenting. And uh, 
So even with that speculation, um, w I, I would come to the conclusion that we, we are dealing with... So okay, I think what was also an inspiration for me around 93, 94, was I look back on other uh, researchers, particularly uh, Professor James MacDonald, and he had, did a two-year research in this field with a team he had a background in meteorology uh, he certainly went out of his way to explore this area internationally and uh, he came to the conclusion in the 1968 senate hearings very similar to what's happened la uh, last year uh, that um, we're and i'm just quoting from him we're dealing with a tentative surveillance by ufos and when i saw that uh, two or three decades ago that was an inspiration for me that I thought, well, this guy must be genuine, what he's saying. So let's look at this. If it's a surveillance, it's something around the earth monitoring us. So by, again, a lot of speculation, uh, modeling, calculating uh, possible trajectories based on, uh, at the time, very little uh, reports uh, from these databases, a maximum of about 30,000, I think, in total, altogether. And some of these were overlapping as well. So um, I worked out with another gentleman uh, who had a background in aerospace engineering that, okay, if it's a 24 hour surveillance, you know, how would you do this? You know, uh, uh, some sort of program of surveillance that is uh, so uh, we broke it up into hourly uh, gaps and we we're finding that okay it's 60 minutes for rotation around the earth for one of these craft as you compare to an artificial satellite which is uh, approximately about 90 minutes um, you, when you're well above the Kármán line in the thermosphere ISS LEOs and so forth so about 90 minutes um, but in this case, uh, we felt it may not be artificial satellite type uh, nature and characteristics in gravitational movement, uh, that uh, it could be something else. The reason why we thought that is because um, when you take all the locations around the Earth where the UFOs were appearing, and this would take in consideration all of Hynek's classification of close encounters, you know, from close encounters of the first kind all the way to the fourth, which would be the, the landing. The third kind is, well, it can be a landing as well. Well, actually, it is a landing, yeah. Um, so taking all that data from uh, the US, South America, um, Europe, but particularly um, the, the US ones, um, that uh, even when you're considering close encounters of the third kind, you really have to take in all the others, like the CE2, close and close of the second kind, which are, you actually do see a construct, a craft of some shape. Uh, close and close of the first kind would be just a, a light uh, that people would be witnessing. Um, so we did have data, if it was true, uh, and we had to validate it as well, um, of all these uh, events that have occurred historically. And we had data going back to the 1880s, so it was very much pre-aeronautical. And also you have to take for a cultural situation as well, because the interpretation of, of these type of events when people see these constructs. Uh, <clears throat> because the construct, or the we'll call it the craft, uh, because this is what people do mainly see, a craft of an extraordinary dimensions in its dynamics. Uh, which is very difficult to integrate into one's reality. Um, so when you take that into consideration, you're dealing with different cultures here. You're dealing with an historical situation as well. Um, even back in the 1880s, right. we, we didn't have a flight as such. Uh, that, uh, okay, so we, we haven't, um, when I say we, at the time, um, we weren't too sure um, did we did we have we made a discovery here to do with the patterns 
uh, because it, 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 there was a lot of um, question marks behind some of the stuff we were doing. Uh, but mind you, we did try it out. Now, either it was a bit of luck or we actually had the evidence for this, but we were uh, successful in recording uh, some of these UFOs at specific locations at specific times on the Earth uh, within the qualifying limits of time for the model to work. Uh, as I said, it could be a bit of luck, but what was really needed was an enormous amount of work in this, like having, you know, thousands of people out there around the world at specific locations at specific times to see does the model work so that so it's very much testable all this um, so a paper was uh, written up and published uh, by Spear in 2001 and we based it on the Hestelin area project Hestelin uh, is uh, uh, is a, a scientific station that was uh, exploring um, possible balls of light um, however there was a phenomena there that were trying to understand these lights that they were recording and that started in 1984 so it was probably a good place to start from you know you had uh, objective uh, information not subjective like with human beings um, but we did find a correlation with our model and that's when the paper came out um, since then Right. Um, okay, so that's the historical side of it and leading up to 2001. But also it helped me to um, go uh, to relocate and actually live at a location where all this activity was taking place. Um, so it also meant to uh, work out a concept design for instrumentation to record these events. Now, of course, one could use uh, conventional instrumentation, assuming that um, that all you're looking at is uh, some sort of light source. But there's a lot behind the light source I've discovered, um, particularly when you're using filtering uh, to see uh, some sort of construction there. Um, altogether, over 20 years, I managed to record only 40 UFOs altogether that's eliminating all other conventional things helicopters right. aircraft birds etc right. you know. is this something that you're still carrying on you're still co uh, collecting data is it is it also your current research right now you're actively researching this at the mm -hmm. moment yeah yeah the my main research at the moment is um, uh, considerably upgrading the actual model uh, because back in I was gonna say the old days uh, we're using Fortran um, you know, probably people don't have never heard of Fortran before. It's a very basic system. But so now we're using artificial intelligence. We're using Python uh, right. for the uh, again experimenting, trying out different orbital tracks that we think might work or not. Um, so I, I'm just going to uh, go into the the main research, the transient nature of UAB uh, has been a scientific problem for scientists to be able to carry out any useful astrophysical research to discover new knowledge. And it was James MacDonald's conclusion in 1968 that uh, the UAP were carrying out a tentative surveillance of the Earth. Uh, this prompted me to investigate a possible global pattern of the UAP issue by examining in the first stage the many databases mm -hmm. there's five well there's five in question now that I'm using to determine first of all the local sidereal time when witnesses observed the phenomena uh, that research I've already carried out which will be published uh, this year in fact there will be a major paper to come out this year which will provide an explanation behind how this uh, global surveillance takes place uh, and this will provide the uh, data that um, a lot of people would be interested in. Uh, the second stage uh, has been an attempt to design a surveillance model so that's what I'm involved in at the moment. 
that correlates as to why these UAP events timings occur at those locations on the Earth. Uh, the surveillance model demonstrates these events occur at specific locations at specific times within qualifying limits for the model to work. Uh, the model provides researchers a resource to carry out further observations that may support further knowledge of the UAP problem. So the transient nature of UAP, what I mean by transient, it's only there it, it, they're, they're witnessed only for maybe a short amount of time and right. there's not enough um, how shall I put it because it's so subjective uh, this is what we're relying on so the transient nature of UP events and hence the unpredictability about when and where the next event will happen is likely one of the main reasons why UAP have not been taken seriously in science circles but how can one identify a pattern without systematically collecting the data in the first place? And in astronomy, the observations like uh, for the location and timing of gamma ray bursts or say supernovas and gravitational waves are similarly unpredictable. Uh, however, we can recognize now uh, that them as natural phenomena arising from stellar evolution so <clears throat> so how, how i mean how did, how did we develop detailed and complex mathematical models that could explain these natural phenomena now it really is by a concerted effort from scientists around the world who meticulously collected data from each occurrence of the event and systematically observed them we still cannot predict when and where such astronomical events will occur in the sky. So it's a very similar situation dealing with the UAP. Probably is a lot more complex with the UAP because it's all subjective. So you need an enormous amount of people around the world witnessing UAP, which there have been. And uh, that's why I'm dealing with uh, about 500, uh, what is it, five? 500,000 reports altogether. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, another important thing, uh, and this is where the inspiration of Mac James MacDonald comes into this, uh, is really, it's a, he's really like a template to perform a thorough scientific investigation. And that can be found in James MacDonald's paper, Science in Default. Now, while he entertains the conclusion that these events could be extraterrestrials, MacDonald's methodology itself is a great example of objective scientific analysis. And this is exactly what we as scientists can do to study these events. <clears throat> and after two years of research with his team, Professor MacDonald made a principal scientist statement to the House Committee on science and aeronautics in 1968 and that UFOs are probably extraterrestrial devices engaged in something that might very tentatively be termed surveillance. So that's really a key statement and conclusion uh, which has inspired not only myself but I do know of other scientists uh, have been inspired by him. Um, mm -hmm. So if we assume that again we're dealing with a model here of a, a global surveillance this would fit in with um, two hypotheses which are noted in the SETI arena uh, that is the zoo hypothesis and the laboratory hypothesis so uh, so these two hypotheses uh, I, um, we I would propose regarding the uh, again, we don't know it's extraterrestrial intelligence we're dealing with, but it's certainly a non-human intelligence responsible for the UAP is the, the zoo hypothesis. That's the monitoring side. And the, the, the laboratory hypothesis is wh when you're uh, relying on reports where there's a behavior behind the UAP. A good example of this is the correlation of UAP activity with the uh, um, nuclear silo bases and nuclear power stations 
uh, there's a significant amount of reports that correlate with those locations. So there is a behavior there, uh, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm only speculating here, but I think the UAP may be the first evidence of an ETI technic signature around the Earth. It would be a class of techno signatures that are presented as exo exogenous intelligent probes, that is, exogenous being outside the solar system that have arrived here in our solar system, and that may have gone beyond the zoo hypothesis, that is, the monitoring of the Earth. So the laboratory hypothesis fits this framework and suggests the importance of further scientific research in a wide range of categories, including the physics, patterns, behavior, and the development of even relations with an ETI or an NHA behind UAP, using possibly novel methods of communications. You could say there has been uh, a tentative form of communications already, particularly with the, um, the Nimitz case in 2004, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, mimicked the F-18 pilots that were uh, exploring uh, the particular Tic Tac that was moving around. Um, the Tic Tac itself seemed to be well aware of what was going on because it could not only mimic what the F-18 pilots were doing, uh, but also it had gone to a location later on, which was a big surprise to the military, of uh, 60 miles from the location where the F-18s were witnessing the Tic Tac, uh, but within a matter of two seconds it had travelled 60 miles to this other location, which was picked up by radar, but it was also a key location that shouldn't have been known because it was confidential. Uh, it, it was fully encrypted. So it seems that the UAP was able to decrypt uh, what was already there. I slightly digress on that one because it's one of the best cases. Um, right. So the theory, uh, just going back to the theory itself, uh, the, the second stage was to attempt to design a surveillance model that correlates as to why these UAP events timings occur at those locations. The, the surveillance mm -hmm. model demonstrates these events occur at specific locations at specific times within qualifying limits for the model to work. So what I mean by qualifying limits, there's a tolerance there uh, of, in this case, for the model to work of plus or minus 20 minutes. <coughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, th but the model actually, um, similarly to what astronomers in their observations of supernovas and gravitational waves, it provides researchers a resource to carry out further observations that may, su may support further knowledge of the, the UAP problem. And that is that if the, through, because it's, te because I, I think it's going to be testable, the actual model, it means that not only scientists can explore this further at specific locations with, in with instrumentation, like for example, the Galileo project comes to mind, but also um, the public participation in this as well because you're dealing with three billion smartphones and there's an opportunity using your smartphone at one of these locations in the future um, there's no guarantee it's going to happen the actual uh, event will happen that is um, but at least the opportunity is there for it may happen um, now that may not be fully scientific just using a smartphone but there are adaptions you can use to improve the detectability. Uh, one could put a, a telephoto lens in front of uh, a smartphone to give you a magnification of say about 20 times. And mm -hmm. also there's inexpensive devices like infrared uh, sensors or infrared cameras, the miniature ones that can be plugged into your smartphone and use the smartphone as the control system um, right infrared actually has, has come down in price considerably in the last 10 or 15 20 years um, when I say considerably I mean you know uh, 
we'll call it a hundred dollars you know 100 euro 100 yeah. euros yeah. 100 pounds um, now you can pick them up um so but the reason i mentioned infrared is because 10 uh, ufos appear and this was discovered oh, about 25 years ago that ufos appear 10 times more in the infrared than in the visible region so it's certainly worth actually Interesting. taking that consideration uh, the ideal thing in science particularly with astronomers is uh, spectroscopy in other words to understand the composition of elements in a star similarly you can do this with the uap uh, by using a diffraction grating uh, they can be mm -hmm. picked up for about a hundred a hundred dollars a hundred euros and they can be located on the lens of the smartphone and by obtaining um, spectra would be would be a treasure in itself because you can understand a lot from a spectra uh, it's really the key right. tool right. that's used in astronomy you know right so just to just to uh, interrupt you there so basically you're saying that in order to sort of validate this model and expand and sort of re make sure it's 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 uh, it's it's correct we need more global participation more eyes from all around the world where people pointing their equipments at the sky and then reporting back and, and recording in the database and then we'll have a more complete picture right that's that's correct ramesh i, I think it's a very exciting project uh because it'll only be exciting once we've uh, uh, are able to fully work out the model uh, right. that, that, that it is testable. Uh, I'm optimistic right. that it will be, but uh, at this point in time. And and at this point, um, we are only concerned with their uh, with their appearance and tracking around Earth, and we're not concerned about where they are originating from, what is the nature of this phenomena, or if they are coming from another galaxy or a planet, how are they able to do it? Because, for, I mean, conventional science says faster than light travel is impossible. Well, yeah, I mean, we're not assuming that it's extraterrestrial. Um, okay. I, I think uh, at this stage we have to classify it as non-human intelligence. Right. Um, now, uh, the point you brought up there that even if you're able to record these events, you know, what does it mean? Well, it certainly adds more knowledge onto the whole um the experiment itself for the model right but it right. but it but if there's enough data to say that oh this is definitely confirming that we do have a controlled program autonomous surveillance of the earth how would you be able to let's say you manage to get an enormous amount of eyes out there how would you plug that data into your theory like is there like a, like a database that you are probably planning to launch where people can go log and report their uh, observations that's one and two how do we how is it reliable i mean it could the, the data could be fudged people could just be you know putting in whatever they feel yeah it's a it's a mixed bag in this one all right uh, i agree with you uh, the first thing actually is to publish the paper uh, because the paper right. will explain as i mentioned earlier how the dynamics how the orbital surveillance takes place uh, in the paper and by the way the paper is not uh, uh, hasn't started yet <laughs> we're still working on the research uh, but the paper okay. will show um, as I say to you the, an explanation behind all this uh, but also we would be relying on um, maybe setting up a website uh, which would have um, okay as as people would go to the website now I I haven't actually conceived any detail at all about this uh, these are just uh, concept designs at this stage but you would need a website where people could interact with and so what we would do is we would show maybe we will actually show a lot of locations around the earth of where these events take place or right. we may actually uh, we might say requested by uh, scientists or the public or whoever that this is my location 
does it fit your model? Uh, I mean, we'd have something fairly simple now. So we'd have the public participating in this, this scientific endeavor. I would see it as a scientific endeavor for the public. So it is um, uh, citizen science, you could say, to some degree, uh, very similar to, you know, citizen science has been there for the last 25 years in other areas of astronomy. So you, th this would be different to the normal citizen science. We would actually have to uh, design the website so that it's easy to use. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, uh, that, that's where we're at. Uh, number one is to get the paper out. Number two, set up the website, uh, see what the reaction is. Um, hopefully there'll be plenty of scientific media publicity. Uh, the more people right. we have, the better for this experiment to see if it works. How would you record temporal data? Like, because, like you said, this is a transient phenomena. Like, so now it's not there. It appears and then it goes and it disappears. So, when you, so you could by by recording, um, you know, instances of observation, you could plot a, ma you know, like a map on a map, where it appears around the globe. But how would you? capture temporal data about the window in which it appears you know like like what what time what uh, what season or what uh, phase of the moon for example like what when does it appear and when does it disappear so how would you capture the time uh, element of it well we would be relying on smartphones and time stamping and that okay. would be good enough the location type stamping even if it's trans well if it's going to be transient anyway the event so it could be seconds it could be minutes uh, that's actually the average timing is up to about 10 minutes a UAP can be present in front of you um, but also it can be just a few seconds but that's actually good enough right. and just quickly jumping to this uh, the UAP surveillance system itself you know the software that you spoke of which was uh, kind of is being rehauled overhauled and recreated in Python and other things uh what wh how what is it what can you just quickly take us through the the, the surveillance system okay we're, we're using um uh, an astrodynamics type of program uh it's used in the aerospace industry or aerospace engineering uh which is uh python led um so that's what we're using at the moment but we've had to um reconfigure it to suit what we're dealing with in this Th this is because we're not dealing with satellites and rocket launches which would have right. to know with our tracks that would be known we're, we're we we've had to configure it to what we think the uaps are doing the orbital tracks that they would be using um i can give you some just some tentative data at this point in time um as to mm -hmm. Uh, how we think it, it may be working is that um, and again this is supporting material from uh, uh, from uh, I'll just give you some examples of other supporting material it's not just the Nimitz um, case which uh, there have been two or three published scientific papers the physics behind this but it gives a lot on the um, the velocities uh, and positions of the UAP in, in, mm -hmm. in its vertical trajectory uh, coming into um, the earth and below on radar. Uh, so we have all that data. Um, it w That data, which is very interesting because it seems to fit in with other data that we got through the Freedom from, for, for Information through the Department of Defense in the US. Uh, there's what's called fast walkers. Uh, the UAP fast walkers have been recorded and normally something like this wouldn't be um, published, but lucky enough, mm -hmm. through the Freedom for, for Information Act, uh, there was a case in 1983 which showed, which recorded one of these fast walkers. Now a fast walker, uh, again, we're uh, we're not dealing with an art, we're not dealing with um, an asteroid here or near earth object you know which would have a 
uh, a very high velocity it could be say 40,000 miles per hour uh, and we're not dealing with say a satellite which would have a, a much lower say what 17 17,000 miles per hour approximately mm -hmm. um, but we're dealing with here something around 25,000 miles per hour so it's an unknown it doesn't really fit those two uh, subjects you know asteroids or or satellites right uh, so we actually got that data another interesting piece of information it's only in the last two years uh, two papers came out on this is uh, you know were there satellites before Sputnik now Sputnik went up in 1957 right. however there have been recordings of anomalies uh, back in the early 1950s so now uh, two papers came out there and one quite recently only three months ago uh, which uh, this is based on um, the Palomar Sky Atlas survey back in the early 1950s uh, in blue plates, sorry, blue filtered plates and red filtered plates and the 50 minute exposure between each plate but in one of the exposures in the red plate it showed up a number of anomalies. Now the anomalies would be they look like um, pinpoint stars and, and, and in one particular case there was three pinpoint stars that showed up on the red plates but they didn't show up 50 minutes later or slightly beyond that in the blue plates and you know you sort of wonder well that is rather strange you know so the paper had gone sorry the the authors of this paper that came out early this year um, had gone through a process of elimination of all the obvious astronomical cosmological um, things that we know of and it just didn't fit so there's a suggestion that this could be um, <laughs> possibly artificial could be an alien spacecraft <laughs> you could say right. um, so um, but what, what is also interesting is that the on the plates it doesn't show up as a uh, as a movement you know you'd see a streak across you know over the 50 minute exposure uh, but in this case is a pinpoint uh, type star like object but three of them in particular so what I'm suggesting that based on our model our model uh, may be able to demonstrate that uh, because we're not dealing with artificial satellites that move around the earth that we're dealing with objects that are synchronized with the rotation of the earth in other words the 24 hour rotation of the earth the orbital tracks are synchronized with the rotation so when you have uh, pinpoint stars of light that may suggest that it was synchronized with the rotation of the earth but this is just speculation at this point but i'm just giving you a flavor of some of the possible supporting material that one could use in this you know now if you look at it uh, statistically there are so many astronomers and so many observatories thousands of them around the world pointing their instruments at the sky why do you think uh, is the re i mean what do you think is the reason uh, for other people not seeing it and other people not coming forward i mean if you'd imagine with so many telescopes pointing at the sky and so many measurements being made uh, in across uh, different spectra, maybe even infrared. Why aren't other mainstream astronomers uh, mm. coming out with this, the seeing the same thing? Is it just fear of ridicule, or there, is it a case of you only see what you're looking for? Yeah, well, you have to realize that um, you know it's very much um, in astronomy, application specific in different fields, and most of the fields rely on telescopes which are a narrow field of view and I mean by narrow uh, could be only a few minutes of arc could be half a degree so the chances of picking up a UAP are very remote right. um, so that's one factor um, even I mean there's also 
Uh, and uh, I know this in dealing with other astronomers, um, particularly in SETI as well. There is um, what I would call a psychological perception problem when dealing with this, uh, not just in interacting with people or scientists mm -hmm. in this area, but also because it, does, it because it's not within their remit, um, it, it it's. Uh, uh, it's difficult to entertain something like this, even if um, they have recorded a UAP. I'll give you an example of, an, of um, there are a number of examples of this, but you may have heard of Dr. Jacques Vallée, oh, yes. uh, who, who originally was an astrophysicist, but he worked at the Paris Observatory as a student. I think he was doing his master's degree there and they actually had recorded a ufo or a uap and he had noted this and he was really disappointed when the professor said that no we're not dealing with this you know so it was put to one side completely dropped but that was the inspiration for him to actually go further in it so you have to realize that <laughs> When it doesn't fit the criteria of what you're dealing with, right? Uh, it's it's just thrown into the bin. You know, it's it's uh, metaphorically speaking. So, yes. and you know, it was just a rare situation having the likes of a person like Jacques Vallée, who was an who became an astrophysicist eventually, um, that he realised that, you know this is reality something's you know but he's an e extreme exception to this world you know mm -hmm. and of course as you probably know he he explored it uh, big time you know as years went on with jerry right Allen. right i i guess this kind of uh, has parallels in archaeology and so many other branches of science where there is a very really entrenched deeply entrenched and accepted traditional model of reality and any data point that is an outlier that doesn't fit in. So instead of um, modifying the model, we just discard them so that we can you know, be with what we already know, I guess. I guess it's a little similar to that. Well, yeah, but see, there's also, you, you know, when you take, um, say, in consideration, um, okay, I was only giving you an example there for that, but on a bigger scale, Ramesh, uh, even when say, um, if you have if you've witnessed a UAP and on an NHI, particularly a craft, and a lot of people have, you're you're dealing with an uh, epistemological shock when everything you thought was true isn't. <laughs> it's a, it's quite a, a dichotomy to be in, so this poses the challenges to our own core notions of reality. So the potential implications of witnessing a UAP, and this includes astronomers as well, and event and eventual, as you probably know, with the US government, there's, there's hearings regarding this disclosure. So right. if there's an eventual disclosure of non-human intelligence and technology may constitute to unfold in a long complicated and I think a very messy process perhaps for decades now it took 150 years from the publication of Copernicus work to gain acceptance of the heliocentric model that asserts that the Sun is the center of the universe today paradigms may change more quickly but there is an added twist in the case of the UAP NHI. Whereas Copernicus was proposing a single definitive shift, the complexity of the UAP NHI phenomena confronts us with a deeper set of challenges to our core notions of reality. For, for example, um, when it, what does it mean to the human or to be human? <laughs> the sovereignty yeah. of the nation even down to that level. Or the authority right. of re the authority of religions. Yes. Uh, so the range of species involved in their motivations. Yeah. So 
it, it's a real complex one. So really, you have, um, I would say, and from my own experience of meeting an enormous amount of people, and whenever the subject is brought up, I've come across two worldviews in this. Uh, so th there's the, the first worldview. Can I just share this with you? Mm -hmm. Because it actually applies to astronomers, scientists as well, uh, and not just um, the public. Because uh, the re see, the reality is fully encompassed in the physical, material world. Uh, and these are the things we can directly observe using traditional, proven scientific methods. Right. Now, given this, given this consciousness, is an epiphenomenon. In other words, it's outside of the human brain. It is fine to engage in metaphysical speculation and spiritual practices but there is no life separate from the human body so that's the scientific materialistic perspective that applies to astronomers uh, a, 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 um, an audience that is one worldview then the second worldview as i see it uh, and rather people i meet is that there are things that manifest in the physical world that seem to originate in another dimension something unseen through scientific observations right so consciousness spirit self soul all have life and existence separate from the physical body you know near-death experiences mm -hmm. out-of-body experience telepathy precognition remote viewing uh, these are just some examples but the point i'm trying to make is that there is a larger reality there um, which is one worldview and then you have this narrow reality which is the other worldview the materialistic approach right, um, right. To, to and science unfortunately the scientific um, approach to this may not be it could be inadequate for what we're dealing with here and uh, i do respect um, uh, say for example the galileo project uh, which is involves quite a lot of scientists but it's very much a materialistic narrow approach to gaining uh, a lot more about the UAP. I mean, you will gain a certain amount, but I, I think we have to deal with a much larger reality to understand this. It's a, it's certainly a wide spectrum of reality we have to deal with here, not a narrow one. Right. This seems to be not just sort of nuts and bolts machinery, but also a phenomenon of consciousness, right? So, like you said, we need to we need different tools uh, to mm -hmm. study this, and. Uh, yes. So in that case, the problem of mainstreaming it and making it academically accepted to study this is even more complicated because what kind of uh, study and what kind of a research modality would you adopt and everything becomes more, well, kind of fringe. Uh, yes. Uh, in, in fact, um, I, I've actually uh, been pioneer pioneering this area. <laughs> I know I have to use that word carefully uh, because I realized this many years ago. Uh, we had this problem and uh, I did uh, I got an invitation from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences there back in 2018 and I gave the presentation uh, and this was on the whole extraterrestrial intelligence area uh, because I find say the Bulgarians Russians there's quite a few Russian people there uh, scientists there uh, but they warned to the fact that um, consciousness is key to this and um, I actually showed how you can do this uh, scientifically in a co as a co-creative process and um, and I actually had proven it as well all right uh, through experimentation um, as you can see I'm <laughs> that's another part of my research has been how to do the communications how can it be done but in a very different way than what we're anticipating using radio dishes in some form um, right so uh, this would be setting up um, a partnership with nature intelligence uh, in a co-creative way so you you're setting up a um, proposing a definition of what the project is going to be and then a direction to it and a purpose behind it um, it's um, there's quite a bit in it involved in this but we actually did test this out and it does work um, so I would see this as uh, a possible way of communications with uh, UAP. 
Um, was anything so, uh, was uh, anything published? Uh, did was any of your study about the, um, in this regard published? Is there is it available in the public domain? Uh, I tr <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing because uh, uh, my all my papers were rejected. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I had um, I had two papers to be presented at the SETI conference in um, in Bremen in t uh, 2018. And unfortunately, they were re rejected, but it was all to do with communications, uh, but from a right. whole different approach. You know. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious. What do you do with the rejected paper? I mean, do you still upload them? Because you obviously believe in it. You're convinced it's it's good work. Uh, would uploading it and making it public on your own website or some other database would it harm your reputation as an academic, or do you just like file it away in your computer somewhere? Hmm. Well, things are different now, Ramesh, because since uh, December 2017, with the admission by the Pentagon that it's a reality. Uh, so yeah. if you've been following all this in the last five years, six years, you can see there's been a lot of confusion going on. But there's going to come a time when communications is going to come up. And this is an area right. that I've actually yeah. explored in some detail. And uh, I have given presentations, lucky enough, to to the UK SETI Research Network back in 2017 um, in this. And I think they're a lot more liberal, uh, th that particular group, because that you're not publishing anything after. But um, so um, I, th the reason I mentioned about the recent historical openness about the reality about the UAP. I think that I may be in a position maybe this year to actually modify it in a way which would be acceptable uh, for the scientific community. Um, oh, by the way, I um, didn't mention this, but I've just got a paper published. I only just got the news today uh, to do with um, possible life form plasmoids in outer space. And that was accepted by uh, ast uh, what do they call it? Astronomy and Aerospace Technology. That's a journal. Yeah. So that that's to do with uh, the life forms. All right. Outside, in space, but in the thermosphere. So it's very much, you know, we're talking about within say, two hundred miles of the Earth, so to speak. Uh, So one last uh, quick question, maybe before we wrap up, are you collaborating with like universities around the world, engaging other students, and encouraging m more of a mainstreaming, uh, mainstream research of this kind of thing at a university level? Uh, no, I'm not actually in the academic community as such. Um, the reason okay. being is I'm actually in the space industry. Um, the, the, I'm involved professionally in uh, optical satellite laser communications. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not actually involved in the academic field as such. This is really more industry-like. Uh, now, right. there is Kingsland Observatory, which is still operating here and in Spain. Um, but my main work actually is in the space industry. Uh, so, all <laughs> all this. All these other things to do with UAP is very much in my spare time. Um, okay. I, 
I mean, I have had um, invitations in the last what two or three years to present to um, universities, uh, but very few. It's it's mainly. Uh, I'm not actually <laughs> I'm not actually after publicity in this area. I have to be very careful. <laughs> to, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. So yeah, but uh, you know, I, I'm. You, you have to be cautious and slowly progressing in this area but i'm sort of monitoring everything as it goes along realizing oh okay they're they're warming to this now so i think i might come in here a bit more yeah but i i have got rejected a number of times and even well not exactly banned from conferences but very close to it mind you so. right well, given the changing uh, climate in uh, UAP disclosure and uh, people warming up to it, I hope that I'm sure the next paper that you come up with all with uh, with your model and your data, I'm sure will will go through and get more acceptance, and then I hope that happens. Uh, yes, I think so. I'm optimistic it will be published. This material I couldn't see it pub being published before 2017. Um, so, lucky enough, there have been. Uh, scientists ha are becoming recognized now in dealing with the physics behind the UAP um, right so these are the kind of people I, I like to deal with that would warm to what I'm doing dealing with of course well that's wonderful uh, let's hope it um, it opens up and we sort of are able to crack this mystery so uh, I think maybe it's a good time to sort of wrap up our conversation today uh, Dr. Anspo, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing us all the all the the research and the data and uh, the information that you gathered. Thank you for uh, inviting me on this. And uh, just uh, uh, digressing a little bit, um, I noticed from your site, I think you had um, interviewed Dr. Colm Kelleher. Is that right? Correct. Yes. 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 I actually saw the interview. I was quite impressed by it. Now I don't know if you know, but um, there was some. Uh, he got some media attention there in the last what, two weeks ago, but he actually mm -hmm. cited my research. I was like pleasantly surprised. And oh, that, he did? Uh, yes. I mean, I can send it on to you. So th there's a number of um, uh, paragraphs yes. on, on my research, but he actually has looked at the material that I've been dealing with, and he agrees absolutely. Yeah, this is not me saying it. But he's actually said it absolutely agree what you know what oh, I've that's, been doing. That's, one, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. So right. he, <laughs> yeah, it's somebody that's fairly well known in the field. So that's that's right. That's been professionally involved in it, of course. Uh, but it's very nice to have that uh, you know compliment there. Yeah. Maybe the next thing you'll get a big, huge contract with Robert Bigelow with Bigelow Aerospace. Who knows? Well, I don't know if you know, but. Uh, uh, a friend of mine there, I think it was a few days ago. Oh, he said, by the way, do you know that uh, Bigelow Aerospace is closed down as of December 2023? Oh, I said, oh, right. Oh, I did not know that. Anyway, pleasure interacting with you today S and wish you all the best for the future for what you're doing, your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.